So in this video, I want to talk about adverse effects of diuretics and mainly focus on electrolyte imbalances that we can see when we take different diuretics. And I also want to uh, mention that all these electrolyte imbalances can be very well predicted when we're going to apply our kidney physiology. We're going to start with effects of diuretics on potassium. So the majority of potassium is reabsorbed paracellularly in the proximal tubule and also in the thick ascending limb. But there's some fine tuning happening here in the connecting tubule collecting duct. And as you remember, Enact reabsorbs sodium, but as sodium gets reabsorbed here, there is some negative charges left behind, and this is going to attract the potassium to leak right back out via this room K channel. So now, uh, what we can definitively predict is that any diuretic that works proximal to, to the connecting tubal collecting duct will let us have more sodium here because all the diuretics work by blocking sodium reabsorption. So if you block sodium reabsorption proximal to the connecting tubal collecting duct, then we're going to have more sodium delivery here. If you have more sodium delivery here, then there's going to be more sodium reabsorption and more potassium leaking out. More potassium leaking out meaning is that we lose potassium. So as a consequence, every diuretic that works proximal to ENAC will have hypokalemia as an adverse effect. So which diuretics work proximal to ENAC? Well, definitely the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, the loop diuretics, and the thiazide. Now, for the potassium-spearing diuretics, it's already in their name. Well, they block the ENAC, so we're not going to have this leaking back, so we're going to spare potassium. Therefore, these drugs lead to hyperkalemia. So next, we're going to look at effects of diuretics on acid-base balance. So when um, sodium gets reabsorbed via ENAC, and potassium leaks right back out. It's not only potassium that is attracted by these negative charges that are left behind when sodium gets reabsorbed. Actually, there are also protons which are attracted by these negative charges and are leaking back out and are attracted by these negative charges. So we're not only losing potassium, we are also losing protons. And so therefore, as a consequence, actually, as an adverse effect, the potassium and the protons kind of go along. So what we can predict is that any diuretic generally that acts proximal to ENAC, we're not only losing potassium, we are also losing protons. And as a consequence, when we are losing protons, we're going to develop an alkalosis, a metabolic alkalosis. And this is found for thiazides and loops. So thiazides and loops have as an adverse effect metabolic alkalosis. It should make sense that the opposite is true for the potassium sparing diuretics because we block here the ENAC. So there's no negative charges, no protons are going to be secreted. So therefore, we can develop a acidosis. Now, I didn't I fill this out yet for carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So let's look what carbonic anhydrase inhibitors do to our acid base imbalance. So let's review first how bicarbonate is reabsorbed because it happens right here in the proximal tubule. So bicarbonate is filtered and then it reacts with the protons that are supplied by NHE together to um, form carbonic acid and then it falls apart to water and CO2 and the water and CO2 gets together again within the cell by ca carbonic anhydrase to carbonic acid, falls apart again and the bicarb is now here again and reabsorbed. So this is bicarb reabsorption. So you can see it's a pretty complicated process. The filtered bicarb first gets together to carbonic acid, falls apart again, diffuses into the cell, gets together to carbonic acid, falls apart again, and then is, uh, is absorbed, reabsorbed. 
Now, when we are using carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, we're not going to supply the protons that are necessary for the filtered bicarb kind of to, to uh, get together and to zap it up and form carbonic acid. Therefore, we're just going to lose bicarbonate. Well, if we lose bicarbonate, what are we going to develop? A acidosis. And so therefore, the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors actually lead to an acidosis. And this also explains why there's not very effective. Because if you have acidosis, well, that means you have protons everywhere. Well, if you have protons everywhere, you're not going to rely so much on carbonic anhydrase. And therefore, the NH is going to work anyway, because there's so many protons around. So let's look next at calcium. Calcium is also reabsorbed predominantly in the proximal tubule, but also in the thick ascending limb, and both paracellularly. And we already discussed for the loop diuretics what they do, because we said, well, normally the NKCC takes up sodium chloride potassium, but the potassium leaks right back out. And as a consequence, you have some positive charges here. And what happens if you have positive charges in such a tubule? Well, other positive charges want to disappear. So they're going to be um, uh, passively reabsorbed, things like calcium, magnesium, and sodium. So as a consequence, when we are blocking this, we're not having these positive charges here. And therefore, there's no driving force to reabsorb paracellularly calcium and magnesium. Therefore, the loop diuretics definitely lead to hypocalcemia. So for the thiazide diuretics, the mechanism on magnesium and calcium is less straightforward. And so we're going to start first with calcium. So the idea is that the thiazides lead to less sodium reabsorption, we're going to lose sodium, we're going to lose water. So the proximal tubule is going to kick in and try to absorb as much as possible of all different solutes, including calcium. So actually, the thiazides lead to hypercalcemia. So next, I want to talk about magnesium. So remember that in contrast to most other ions that are predominantly reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, magnesium is predominantly reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb. And we already explained the mechanism. So generally, when NKCC takes back up sodium chloride and potassium, potassium leaks right back out. We accumulate positive charges. And this is a driving force for the paracellular reabsorption of magnesium. Now, when you block this with the loops, you're not going to have the positive charges. So magnesium is not going to, there's no driving force to reabsorb magnesium. So loops lose magnesium. So therefore, we have hypomagnesemia. Now, for the thiazides, it's a little bit of a different mechanism. So it turns out that in the distal convoluted tubule, we have also a channel that reabsorbs magnesium. And this channel is called TRIPM6. It has an M in its name that you can recognize it's responsible for magnesium reabsorption. And it just turns out that the, uh, that the NCC kind of works together with this TRIPM6. So if you block NCC, the TRIPM6 is also not working. So as a consequence, the thiazides also lead to hypomagnesemia. Now, what happens to uric acid? It's also important to realize that all these more efficacious diuretics like thiazide and the loops lead to volume depletion. So therefore, as a consequence, there's more sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule. So there's also more reabsorption of any solutes, including uric acid. Therefore, as a consequence in the proximal tubule, as we are going to reabsorb more solutes, more uric acid, these diuretics that are highly efficacious can lead to hyperuricemia, which means patients on loops and thiazide can develop a gout attack. I just want to finish up with a couple of other miscellaneous adverse effects. So a very important adverse effect for the loop diuretics is ototoxicity. So I'm just going to add this here. So you can get a tinnitus. And um, this has to do that we find also this NKCC in the inner ear. 
Other important adverse effects for diuretics in general are that thiazide diuretics and also the loop can lead to hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia. And this goes along with the hypokalemia. So these are also found in loop diuretics. So thiazides and loops do that. I also want to mention that for the potassium sparing diuretics, the ones that act at the mineralocorticoid receptor, pat particularly spironolactone, can also lead to gynecomastion impotence. And the reason for that is has to do with the mineralocorticoid effect, so it's not seen with triamterin um, because they're not as clean. They also work on androgen receptors, so also androgen receptor antagonists, and that are these adverse effects like gynecomastia and impotence, which can be explained by their effects on the androgen receptor. This concludes the video on adverse effects of diuretics.